Normally, I try not to do videos in this fashion simply because it seems to be more talking head than usual when it comes to the videos that I'm recording out there on the bench. But I've been busy all weekend working on a little project that's been, well, on the back burner for quite a while. And quite simply, I had spare time in my hands, so I might as well do it. Plus, I have more experience with what I'm doing compared to when I first started this project over five years ago. So, if you remember from one of my earlier videos, this here is the Master Voice Butler in a Box. Uh, this one here is actually labeled as the Master Voice ECU. After that video, I got this unit here. Um, visually, it's identical other than the badge. Um, the first one we got, as we may remember, it has a broken evacuation nipple on the display, so as a result, the display didn't work. This one here has a good evacuation nipple and a good display on it, so the display works, but what has happened is that the potting compound for the security module didn't really cure, so over time, like a very thick pitch, it just kind of ran down the board. This one here didn't want to work like at all um like you get like a light you get like activity from this and the microphone and it wouldn't do anything else uh so this one here became a candidate for trying to solve a couple of mysteries about the master voice butler in a box that otherwise would have been fairly destructive to complete on their own and don't get me wrong this was a fairly destructive job to do this so you'll notice immediately we don't have any ports in the back, and that's because I've taken the board out. This is the board out of a Butler in the Box. So I can tell between the Series 2, the original Butler in the Box, and the ECU, they're all exactly the same. You have these two EPROMs here. One's listed as, I guess, like, I don't know, it says ECU. Both of these, I'm assuming, are like your basic default programming for the unit. Um, I did run a checksum check. They are somewhat similar so there's really no major changes or revisions here it may just could be like OEM information or something like that stuff that's necessarily not secure what is secure however is the rest of the system most notably the four character alphanumeric pin code which is needed whenever this thing loses power and the battery backup fails as well that is stored in a module which would live right here and that's again potted with epoxy resin you can see some artifacts of that here. Um, and uh, so we knew something was going on in there. Like there is no CPU on this board. These two chips here are basically parallel drivers and stuff like that. So it had to be inside of this module. Um, because this one didn't work, this was the best candidate I had for doing a semi-destructive job getting the module out breaking the module down and figuring out exactly what is in the module and figuring out how exactly the module works. The goal here is that while not every butler in a box that shows up on eBay or for sale has the pin, if we can find a way to persuade the pin out of the unit without having to be as destructive as this, well, there we go. We can now just well, I can't say that it's now free and easy to do. There will be some fairly in-depth work trying to dump whatever's in there, but now we know exactly what's going on. There are no more secrets in here. And, oh, believe me, there's a fair number of secrets that were hiding inside of this. So, removal of the module was definitely something on its own right. Here, let me just quickly pull up a photo of this thing because it was just... Oh, my God. Yeah, so what happened is that you can see the resin in there. Uh, there's two pin headers, and they secure here and here. And when I heated this up, like, whatever not cured resin was still there was just getting everywhere. I ended up pulling a ton of vias and trace, traces out of this thing. Um, yeah, it wasn't enjoyable. But it did clean up. Uh, I ended up swapping out this socket, this socket, these sockets... There's a socket down over here. These three chips ended up getting socketed. Basically, this whole corner of the board here had to be stripped, cleaned. The broken traces were patched. The broken vias were patched. This is now ready to go. Um, I'm just going to put an actual pin header socket in here this time so I don't have to solder this crap in. Um, and then as for the module itself, I have it right here. 
Um, that took a considerable amount of work, but here it is. Um, I've removed the pin header. Um, just about all traces of the potting has been removed. And now we can see, yes, the CPU is in here, but there's also an EEPROM, a PROM, and a tri-state uh, latch buffer. I believe it's a latch buffer. We'll double check on that in a moment. Anyways, I'm not gonna point this all out here on the webcam. So I'm actually gonna switch over to the desktop now. There we go. There was that picture there. So what I would do is that this is the ultimate tool in masking out and following traces. This is just GIMP. There's nothing special about this. It's just GIMP. I love using layers. As a result, I can color code them and I can overlay them over graphics. So I took the board, which is right here. And from that, I was actually able to, before I put everything into sockets, originally these were soldered in, there's no way in hell I'm going to de-socket this. So there was some guesswork that was done, but I didn't really have to. But I was able to remove these three chips, and now we can see all the traces going on in here. Uh, same goes for the back side. There was a single bodge wire, and... That I can tell, like this one here is one I added in there because the original one, well, we lost it when we were depotting, but I knew exactly where it went. So sure, whatever, consider this to be original. And from there, I was able to then determine exactly what was going on inside of this and what everything was. So to start off, we have an R6501Q. That is essentially a one-chip microprocessor that's based off of the 6502. It refers to it as an enhanced 6502 CPU. And that is our brains, obviously. Um, there are four ports. There is an address bus, the data bus, and a uh, non-mask interrupt, and a few other things. Um, it was worth noting that you see some of these pins here are copper-plated. I think what happened is that there was something going on. Again, the potting compound didn't fully cure and it was attacking some of the pins. So that's concerning, but okay, sure, whatever. Um, I don't necessarily need it working now that I know what's going on here. I can actually replace that chip if I oh so desired. Uh, down here, we have our fairly standard 2764 Intel. Um, now, they refer to here as a erasable UV erasable PROM, it's an EEPROM. That's all it is. So that's holding, I'm assuming, a significant amount of code that runs the CPU, and then whatever they didn't want to keep their trade secrets in here stored in, were stored in those two EEPROMs that were located outside of the module on the main board. Then we come down to this little sucker right here, uh, the AM27S21. That there is, in fact, a bipolar PROM, 1024 bits in arrangement of 256 by 4. Um, okay, uh, that was completely unexpected. So that would mean that it's safe to say that the pin is either stored in here or it's stored in here as like an additional area of space that can't be normally seen as opposed to the EEPROM. Or this is doing something where it's just doing some weird address decoding logic or something like that. Um, I'll show you a bit more. And then this down here, this is, it's not a ROM, it's not RAM, it's a 74HCT245N. And this here is an octal bus transceiver with three state outputs on it. So, uh, really nothing fancy about that, but it's an HC, so it's a high speed part as well. Um, let's start on the very top here of our masks. And the first thing I noticed, well, the last thing I noticed, is our unused pins. And it's also worth pointing out at this time here that I do have masks for all of these chips, so we'll be cycling through those as well. Um, we have a single unused pin here, and that is the sync pin. Um, I don't, the documentation just states what that does. I yeah, obviously there was no need to use the sync pin. Uh, we have one pin on the header here, which just kind of goes up and stops, and it seems to go 
absolutely nowhere. Here, let's use the depopulated version of it. I don't see it on the front. I don't see it on the back. Hold on, let's turn that one on. There we go. Yeah, it just kind of goes up there, does nothing. But it's worth pointing out, there's this 2.2K resistor that's living right here. And the whole spacing for that is identical here. So it's almost like you could put a diode or a resistor or something there and some sort of external voltage, something was coming into the module from here. But in this revision, at least, it wasn't needed, so it was just a deleted part. Uh, this has four 8-bit ports on it, so the first one I call is uh, PA. And for this one, most of the traces are living on the back of the board. And we can see them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and there's an eighth one that's living over here. And they all immediately exit out of the module. They don't actually interact with the module at all. The next one here is port B. Same thing as before, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they just exit out through these pin headers here, don't interact with the system at all. Uh, now things get interesting with port C. You now have two lines that drop down here and go to two pins on the PROM. And what were those pins again? If I can turn that on. It's like A, oh God, zero, one, three. It's like two of the A pins down there on that. It's a bit blurry, but you get the idea. You can look up the data sheet if you want. And those are living on this side. You do also see there's an additional line here and that's because there's stuff happening on the back side. And turn off that. So you can see six of the lines immediately exit out. Then we have these two here. They go to the PROM, but they also go here. They do exit out over here, but it also ends up coming over here and it goes into the EEPROM. And we have one pin here, which isn't used. It just kind of shows up there and then disappears. But these two lines are then doing something with the PROM and the EEPROM, but they're still accessible from the outside world. Now, turn those off. And then port D, which again is entirely accessible from the rear of it. Uh, same thing as before, one, two, three, exit, four, five, six, seven, exit. Uh, oh, have I missed one? No, okay. So they exit out of the unit and don't do anything on their own regard as well. So from there, we then switch over to the address bus and then things begin to get interesting. So from the front side of the board, we can see here the, what was it 14, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 pins. Uh, some of them go to the PROM. Um, a fair number of them go over to the EEPROM. And if we switch on the rear layer, we can also now see many of these pins exit out of the board over here as well. So that means the e, uh, this is the first real sign that the EEPROM is now available or accessible from the outside of the module, as well as the PROM in a sense here, but obviously not all the pins. And where is the backside? There we go. And again, same thing. So there you go. There's a number of vias that are at play now, and that's explaining what's going on right here. But okay, so far, pretty straightforward. And then we get to the data bus for the CPU. I'll turn that on. And notice there's our eight bits. Go down here to the EEPROM. They go to the tri-state, but they do not go out of the module. So to read back an EEPROM that's encapsulated, you need access to both the address bus and the data bus, among a few other pins. So this is the first real catch in that dumping this thing is not as easy as just finding those pins, there you go, because the data bus isn't accessible. But it goes to this tri-state here. This is gonna come back, and not so much to haunt us, but it, it's interesting what they're doing here. So that is, for the most part, everything is on the front side. There is a couple of bridges here, or a couple of traces on the back side that go from via to via just for the rear to link everything up. You can just kind of see them hiding there. Let me turn that layer off. There you go. And there they are. So that is our data bus, which is our first real what's going on here. 
we have a second clock phase pin, which is accessible to the CPU. Uh, same as before. This is on the rear, so comes up, goes to one pin. There you go. Uh, we have a reset line. Same thing. There it is. There it goes. We have a read-write control line, which is, where is that? There it is. It's a gray, gray wire. Great. Nice color coding. There's so many colors applied to this. I'll show you at the end. Um, again, this here goes straight out of here. All the read-write does is it changes the direction of the data bus. So, and then I have XTLI. I don't know if that's an external crystal reference. Actually, it should actually tell me on here, what was XTLI? XTLI, crystal or clock input for internal clock oscillator. Okay, yes, yeah, so it does, okay, yeah. Uh, if XTLO is connected to VSS or the X4 clock is floated, crystal output from internal, uh, if, oh, okay, allows input of X1 clock signal if XTLO is connected to VSS or of X4 clock if XTLO is floated. Well, in this case here, it is pulled to ground um, I'll show that in a moment. Uh, we do have this line here, VRR, and this is just simply an auxiliary power pin for when the main power source to the CPU is lost. There is our non-mask interrupt there. Again, doesn't do anything with the board, just exit straight out and off it goes. And then we have VCC, which is first going to require the front. There we go. This is interesting. So let me turn on the rear layer. There we go. So what's happening is VCC is the darker yellow here. And I can see it comes in, goes to the CPU, goes to this decoupling cap, goes over here, the EEPROM, the tri-state, and it comes down here to the PROM. But it goes through this 2.2K resistor. And now I've marked that with a lighter yellow. And it goes back down here to this pin on the PROM. And then it goes to this pin here on the tri-state, which if I recall, where is that? Uh, is the output uh, enable line. Is that enable? Yes, that is the output enable line. So that gets pulled high through the resistor, but it also exits out of the board as well, which... I'm not sure what they're trying to do here uh, unless it's an output, it's like an extra signal that's delivered or if power has to be fed backwards through here, uh, this allows you to power up the tri-state, it allows you to power up the PROM, but it doesn't let you power up the EEPROM necessarily because it's going through this resistor which may current limit at 2.2K. Um, it's, it's bizarre. And yes, most of what's happening here again is happening on the back of the board. Pins come in and just route around like that. Okay, so that was our VCC and then VSS slash ground. I think we covered that there. So there was our uh, crystal. There's our ground pull down on that there. The ground for this here, instead of going and then down here, goes around and in. And I've checked that. Uh, the ground does use four pins on the header here, and it serves pretty much everything else. So we can see it does the PROM, decoupling cap, it does the tri-state, and if I turn on the rear layer here, you can see it does this side of the decoupler, this side of the decoupler, and it does the EEPROM as well. And here's what it looks like on the back side. So it just serves ground to everything here. There is nothing special about that at all. And then now, this is where things get really bizarre. So with an EEPROM or a device like this, um, especially when it's potted, it's considered a one-time programmable device, or at least you leave the window open on the EEPROM, so if you have to go back and make a revision, you can. But then you typically socket or something like that. Um, for some reason, there is a VPP pin accessible from the pin header. And that's all it does, just goes around to the back, there you go, goes through a via cross and into the pin. This normally isn't supposed to be accessible in final release products, 
because this means that you can apply a programming voltage to the EEPROM while it's in use, which I'm not sure why you would do that, but okay. Um, when you have it encapsulated like this, it's basically considered a one-time programmable mask ROM because you can't wipe it. So if there was something going on here, um, yeah, I, I just I don't understand why they did this. Um, mind you, that's not the only pin that we need to program this. This just supplies the programming voltage. Um, what happens if we need, um, well, we do require the uh, pin that allows for programming or program enable. Yes, it's there as well. So we now have going to this EEPROM power. We have VPP. We have program enable. We have the address lines, but we don't have the data lines. They're still blocked by the tri-state here, though we can see the other side of the tri-state is already Xing out through the pin header here. So that is I, strange, really strange. Like I have a hypothesis that I'm building here and we'll get to it, but for now, let's just keep going. Uh, chip enable is available here and you can see it comes from this pin goes to that via there, and then goes to chip enable on the EEPROM. And it does on the front route down to the PROM right here. So chip enable is available for both the PROM and the EEPROM uh, on its own dedicated line. And then we have, now I have it labeled here as BX. So as I uh, will remind you, uh, where are you? Were you this one? No, not this one. Where the heck was it? Here we go, yes. So there's our data bus going down to the tri-state. There's our masking for the tri-state. So A1 through A8, B1 through B8, and then we have U. So now it's starting to make a little bit more sense. Let me turn that layer off. And let me turn that off as well. So the data bus is here internally accessible to the EEPROM whenever it wants full time. Access from the outside is restricted and controlled by the tri-state. So now we technically then have the address bus, the data bus, the program lines, everything which is now being uh, only regulated by the data bus right here through the tri-state. We do have an external power source to um, output enable. And we do have another pin we'll get down to right here. And I'm assuming that's like the last major lock that prevents someone externally from programming or reading back this chip is they have to know that this tri-state is present and how to operate it. That way, everything needed to dump this EEPROM without depotting the module is available right there. So let's turn off you. Let's turn off you. And here's our output enable for the EEPROM, which again is living on the back side of the board. So that's, all, so that's damn near every pin now for this EEPROM. Single wire, nothing else goes to it. And then we have two lines on the PROM here. Just gonna see if I can pull that one up. There we go. Um, these are um, Q2 and Q0. And these ones here don't interact with the board at all. They go straight out to their own respective pins. And that's about it. So now we damn near have everything. There's one more pin that we're missing down here on the uh, tri-state and that's direction of the bus, and that's one pin controlled from the outside. Uh, lastly, really the only pins that are left on this thing are these two right here with the bodge wire. So that I can tell, um, these two pins don't go anywhere else in this system. That's G1 and G2. Um, this hole right here, or this pin here that goes outside, has no traces going to it. So maybe it was a spare, I'm not sure, but there's a single bodge wire that goes across and over and it links them together. There's nothing else there. Otherwise, that is everything 
on this board. So now we know how the CPU interacts with the outside world. Now we know how the EEPROM interacts with the CPU and the outside world. The tri-state controls the data bus and its direction so that, in theory, I mean, you can read from this externally, but it does require you to know which pins to pull on it. And now we see which pins are pulled on it. Um, you can, in theory, write to this EEPROM when it's first installed and potted it's, and treat it as a one-time programmable part. If you have a bad burn, which I'm not sure how they control the likelihood of that happening, the whole module, however, is junk because how do you exactly do you remove this stupid EEPROM? Why not just use a mask EEPROM at that point? Maybe it was a pin thing. Uh, and then we have this PROM down here. So I have dumped this EEPROM. Um, I have, I'm no expert when it comes to 6502 assembly, so I'm not entirely sure if this PROM is upfuscating it or what. Um, I have no idea at this time how to dump that PROM. So, is the pin hiding in here, along with the main code that runs the unit? Maybe. Is it hiding over here? Maybe. But I'm glad that after a considerable amount of work, this took like 12 hours to do, I am finally done with this blasted board. And as you can see, it is quite an art show as I start to turn on all of these layers. Um, it is worth pointing out, um, this is the reason why I use GIMP. Sure, it made a 50 megabyte file, but it's able to handle all these layers. I can address the color coding, and as a result, there you go. There is no more mysteries inside the security module of the Master Voice Butler in a box. There isn't even security bit set that I'm aware of for the PROM or the EEPROM. So we know how it works. Now it comes down to the hardware reverse engineering is done. Now it's just the code. But I thought it would be cool to at least show you what I was doing in my spare time. Keyword here, spare time. This is ridiculous, but at the same time, um, I found this to be kind of fun because no one's done this before. As I started to pull this module off that I'm aware of, no one has tried to do this at all. So there's a little bit of e-cred going on here, but at the same time, I'm really hoping that what I've shown you today is helpful if you yourself want to continue on what I'm doing and figure out how to crack that pin. Maybe there's an extra secret pin in there that we're not aware of. Take a look for it for yourself. Um, and that's all for this video, and I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, have a good one.